Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are Driving Concern Employer Traffic Safety Program. Pleased to be able to offer the webinar, Impairment in the Workplace, being alert to what may be impacting your workplace safety. I want to welcome our presenters this morning, Lisa Robinson, Senior Program Manager with the National Safety Council, and Cindy Leonard, Program Manager with the National Safety Council. A few things to note before we get started. If you joined us via phone, please press star six to ensure your phone is muted. This will minimize background noise and ensure sound quality. The presentation was made available for download when you logged in. You do have the ability to type questions during the webinar using the chat function at any time during this webinar. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you should encounter any problems or issues, please type a message in the chat function to let us know, or you can email me at deanne.crane at nsv.org. The presenter's contact information will be available on the last slide, and there is a very brief post-event survey at the conclusion of the webinar. Because this program is grant funded through grant dollars and provided at no cost to you, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. And with that, I welcome Lisa and Cindy, and we'll turn it over to them to begin. Good morning, everybody. Um, Cindy, good morning. Deanne, thank you so much for that. We are really excited to be here with you this morning because we really want to talk about what does it look like right now when we think about impairment in the workplace and how is that really affecting um, the workplace. We know that transportation is the leading occupational fatality. We're all aware of that. You know, there's a few less cars on the roads today. However, we're all seeing things about speeding and, and different things that are happening. But, you know, we know that impairment is, is truly a, affects a lot of different components within the workplace. And so I think it's really important to understand that we talk about transportation, but also the other aspects that employees do on the job can be affected by impairment. And when we talk about impairment, that can be a variety of things. And so, you know, we know that employers have shared some information that really talk about how um, they are affected or maybe they really don't know or they're not really prepared or they're really unsure. And what does impairment look like? So when we talk about impairment, what exactly does that mean for an employer? When we think about employees' job functions, what does that exactly mean, you know, currently in, you know, the, the situation that we find ourselves in today, um, yesterday or tomorrow? So, Cindy, I know that you've got some great things that you're going to bring in regarding, um, employ, you know, impairment, so I'm going to ask you to go ahead and start. Okay, well, thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. And I'd like to just reiterate, we are really glad that you're here with us today. We have several other webinar opportunities that are coming up shortly, um, and those were on the first slide. The slide deck, I believe, is available to you, and I'll be sending a follow-up email that includes some of those as well. So um, the one that was not mentioned on the webinar uh, slide pre previously, though, that you might be interested in is our complete DIDI training, which will be available as a webinar, a WebEx-based uh, platform the end of this month, I believe it's April 29th, and I'll send you a link for registering for that. Many of the topics that we cover today are covered more comprehensively in that training, so we'd look forward to, to you participating in that if you have not already. Um, in, a, in a survey that Lisa and I have talked a lot about uh, between us and with other employers, this survey shows that drug misuse Prescription drug misuse is a concern for employers, and we know that statistically 70% of employers have been impacted by prescription drug misuse. We also know that most of them don't feel like they're prepared to deal with that when it enters into the workplace. 19% feel extremely prepared, which means about 81% don't feel as comfortable uh, when it comes to this topic. So we know this is an issue that may be overlooked, but may be becoming more prevalent and more of a concern as we enter into this COVID-19 era that we're in. And so here's a little question for you to get your, get your mind flowing and use that chat box function to help us suss this out. What do you think? What percent of illegal drug users are currently employed? Now this is illegal drug users. We're going to talk a lot about alcohol. We're going to talk about prescription and illegal drugs. 
Um, we're going to cover a lot of this in the next 20 minutes, but if we're just thinking about illegal drug users, what percentage do you think are currently actually employed? And it may come as a surprise to you. I know it came to, as a surprise to uh, some of us when you find out that it's actually pretty high. The illegal drug user doesn't fit that stereotype that you or I may have grown up with as being the person on the side of the street that looks like they don't have something to occupy their time. Uh, many uh, illegal drug users are currently employed, successfully employed, um, and, and covering up a, a possible misuse problem that could be impacting the workplace. And we know when it comes down to dollars and cents, that means a substance abuser is going to be three times more likely or three, have three times more sick days than someone else, and they're five times more likely to file a workers' comp claim. So these are concerns for an employer if we're just talking about money. And then obviously there's the non-money cost to having um, a workplace that's impacted by substance use. Lisa, I know you were wanting to talk a little bit about a survey this morning that we saw. Yes, Cindy, you know, you had some really good points. You actually saw it and you shared it with me, and I'm going to have you bring up a couple of those points. Okay. You know, when all of this started, we know when the pandemic came out, my first, one of my first comments and one of my first thoughts is, you know, if people are working remotely, they're only a few feet from maybe their home bar or their home liquor cabinet. And I also said, what about the stress? And what if, uh, what if they're working remotely and they've decided that it's okay to have a couple drinks because I'm not driving, but maybe they have to go out later to do something. And so I did ask and question, and some of the things I said is stress and the alcohol being a little bit more available. And so I think you have a couple really great points from that survey this morning. I do. You know, Lisa, I think you had a really good pulse on what was going on at the time, and now we have a little bit of data to, to support some of your intuition on that. Yeah, we know definitely employees are struggling on just the adaptation from home or from the working environment to now the home working environment. And that struggle is coming in different forms for everybody, right? It's sharing the space. It's maybe having your children underfoot, your pets, um, you know, having just uh, not the same ergonomics that you're used to at home. And so the, the study that we reference is on 3,000 adults who were recently surveyed by alcohol.org. And what they found was that 35% of Americans say they are more likely or to drink more while they're self-isolating. So 35% of our fellow Americans say that they are definitely imbibing and drinking more uh, now that they're self-isolating. And the, the article that I read broke it down by state, since a lot of us are in Texas, I'll just refer to the statistics on Texas state that 22% of Texans admit that they're drinking alcohol at home during working hours. So we used to consider alcohol as an off the job, an off the job concern that may impact on the job. But as so many people are now working in the home space next to the liquor cabinet, so to speak, as Lisa says, we know that, um, that many of them are engaging in, in alcohol uh, during the work hours, not just beyond. So what that impairment looks like in terms of just comparing how much beer creates how much blood alcohol concentration is shown on this uh, chart that you see right here. We know that impairment begins before 0 0.02 BAC, but these are the characteristics that we begin to see at the bottom of the chart, and you've probably had some time now to look at some of the other characteristics that, that ensue. So. We talk about safety, we talk about transportation safety, but really the impact goes beyond just transportation safety and into all kinds of uh, work outcomes that we don't want to see. Uh, so let's take a look now at what that's going to look like. If somebody has been drinking enough to have a BAC level of 0.117, it can take approximately um, I, about nine hours for that alcohol to be completely out of the system. So Lisa, what does that mean for somebody who's going to a bar, watching a sporting event on a Sunday night, the sporting event goes into overtime, they're drinking more as a result, it's a really good game. What can happen on Monday morning when they're ready to go back to work? 
You know, I think this is one of the points that get overlooked to me. People think because I went to sleep, I went to bed, I'm not impaired in the morning. And I don't think that they understand how, you know, alcohol in their system and how it takes to get out of the system. So they may actually be getting up driving. They're actually still impaired while they're driving to work. They're actually impaired while they're beginning work. And so I don't think people understand that enough to understand that, you know, what does my body need and how is alcohol impairing me possibly? Because they think it's legal to drink it, right? Um, they don't believe that they're 0.08, but they can be impaired at, at under 0.08. And again, remember I had coffee and I went to sleep for a little while, so I'm good. And sure. I think that's the biggest misconception. It is, and that sort of hangover effect that leads to sluggishness is going to affect your, your productivity, and it's out, actually caused by the presence of alcohol still in the bloodstream. So here's another list of, of possible uh, characteristics that you might see in somebody who is experiencing alcohol impairment on the job or is frequently um, it, using alcohol before work or having that impact. Um, we, we haven't talked lately about inhalants, Lisa. Tell me why you think inhalants are so important for workplace to consider. Well, Cindy, well, Cindy, you know, one of the things you and I talked about even this morning is I said, you know, and I made a comment earlier about, you know, how, you know, the alcohol is really prevalent. I think we overlook solvents. We use them in the workplace. We use them in our workplace, maybe our home right now, right? They may be in our vehicle based on the type of job that we do, okay? So solvents are everywhere. They're readily available. We see them in all sorts of job functions, all sorts of tasks that we do where we use these solvents. We don't think of them a lot of times as anything other than the function that they are, they are intended to do, right? Like I have a can of keyboard cleaner, correct? Well, mm -hmm. it's sitting next to me so that I can, you know, clean my keyboard in my area. But actually in some cases, it's not just keyboard cleaner. So I think we overlook some of those things that are right there in front of us. And we don't realize the fact that that is an impairing um, component that can affect um, our employees. Absolutely, Lisa. You make so many good good points about how prevalent these are too, especially as we're working between home and between between a workplace. Depending on what the solvent is, it may or may not be more prevalent in your workplace. But you know, we knew of a case um, of somebody who was using keyboard cleaner to inhale and multiple cans were being ordered from this department who didn't, and the department did not have computers. So it should be on your radar as an employer to see what's your inventory like? Have, the, have there been changes? Have you noticed something that's going missing or that you're running through at a really fast rate? Um, right. Likely it could be the cause of somebody who's using the inhalant. People have to, the inhalant high is a very short-lived high, and so in order to sustain that high or, or renew it, somebody who's using an inhalant is, is going to go through a product very quickly in comparison to just normal day-to-day -day use. So that's something to keep in mind. And one of the things that the signs and actions that you might notice are listed here, there are so many signs and actions here that wouldn't be related to inhaling, right? Uh, certainly, if you have an employee that's nauseous on the work in the workplace, there are lots of reasons for that nausea, right? There could be lots of things. So you don't want to jump to suspicions too quickly. But, you know, when you see things that are recurring or that just don't make sense, it may be a good time to circle back and see what could be going on with somebody um, and what, in what influences or what impairment could be right under your nose. So Lisa went on a little fact-finding mission. She likes to do this about every six months or so, and then I get, it, I get these calls. Cindy, have you seen this? Can you believe this? So Lisa, talk to us a little bit about what you found just the other day on the Internet. You know, one of the, most, one of the best speakers that you and I have heard talks a lot about how it's right in front of us. You know, that he goes every city he and he will do a little search, and he has undercover video, and he can show automatically all of these different things. And it's so fascinating. And I think that we just always assume everything's great. And it's so exciting sometimes when I go, can you believe how readily available sash cans are? They are prevalent. They are, I mean, you know, you go to someone, I've been somewhere where I've been for a meeting, and I go in the ladies' restroom, and there's all sorts of supplies on the counter, right? There's an aerosol can of hairspray. There's a hairbrush. There's all of these things. You know, I don't know that you're going to look at a can of peanut butter laying on the, on the counter maybe the same way or somebody's desk, right? 
a lint roller. You know, all of these things are easily found and are a way that people consume items, whether it's illicit, um, over-the-counter over the prescription medications, something that they may not want someone to know about. And they're readily available, easily accessible, easily order to find, easily order, able to order them directly to your home. And so it's just interesting to see how many different ways that people can, you know, conceal, you know. I thought this was probably one of the most, most interesting that I found yesterday was, um, these bolts, I was shocked because I'm like, okay, you know what? You're going to look in somebody's um, toolbox and see all these bolts. Are you going to think anything differently about them? These are stashes. I would have never thought that I would have seen a bolt that would be used as a way to hide a stash, but it's it's available and you can order it. Same way with the mouse. Am I going to look at a keyboard? You know, a mouse. You know, again, the same way. Maybe, maybe not. But. These are things that I found within a matter of seconds and I could order and have delivered to my home. And so we have to understand that impairment um, has a lot of other components with it, not just the employee that may have some symptoms, but there's going to be some other things that they're doing to conceal the impairment in the workplace. I mean, and I, and, and it was funny yesterday whenever I made a comment about the chapsticks, Cindy, and you, what did you tell me? You're like, if I would have known that. I said, I have chapstick you know. all over the place. It's in my office. It's in my pocket. It's by my bed. You know, it's all over the place. And what did you say? I'm going to probably take the bottom off of it to see if there's anything inside it. And I'm just kidding. But, but again, we, we just automatically assume that the product is what the product is. And having an understanding of, you know what, this can occur in the workplace. These are things that have been found. I mean, I'm sure we've all watched IPD or COPS or any of the shows, and you actually see, you know, that they're opening up a Band-Aid container. They're opening up something else. They find stashes in a variety of places. And it's so interesting because, you know, we probably wouldn't think about that. But um, understanding that I think is really important for the employer. Well, I think so, too. And I always love it when you find these new ideas. Lisa, I had no idea that a mouse could be used to stash. Really, basically anything that is sold as a product to sell uh, to somebody who wants to have a hiding place for jewelry or money, you know, just substitute the word drug in that instead. And instead of a jewelry hide or a money hide, you have a drug hide now. So all these products are used. Um, now, looking at the products that we see on this puzzler, what would you say, and tell us in the chat, what would you say about these products and which ones would be uh, capable of being sniffed in order to get high? And there, yes, there are more than one correct answer for this. So uh, we, you know, we talked about, we ran through a quick list of inhalants, and of course you'll be able to look at that more on the slide deck following the presentation today. But uh, we see a lot of different things here. What do you think? What would be used in order to sniff to get high? And the answer is basically everything but the lipstick. Uh, to date, we don't have lipsticks that have the kinds of fumes that would produce a high. But definitely we see, you know, permanent markers, any kind of solvent like a super glue or other kinds of glues that are, um, are made by strong chemicals, whipped cream in the break room refrigerator, and that hairspray that Lisa talked about that's sitting out in the bathroom as you walk in. Uh, you know, lots of different things could be used for these purposes. We're going to talk now a little bit about some of the things that we notice with central nervous system depressants and central nervous system stimulants. And those are more commonly referred to as uppers and downers. In this particular case, we have a guy, and he's fictional. This is just a picture of a fictional character. He drives a forklift, he works two jobs, and he needs something to get him going in the morning, we think, and we've also been told that he is taking something at night to help him wind down to go to sleep. So these are some of the features that we would see from somebody who's taking something to get up and something to go down. And uh, we would see these in the workplace, and maybe they would be of safety concern. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about um, how this could be impacting differently in the COVID-19 era? 
Well, absolutely, because when there's heightened stress to me, people are looking for ways to cope. And I kind of made a comment yesterday when we were talking about it. I'm like, it's like the energy drink in the morning and maybe even the over-the-counter medication to be able to fall asleep, right? People are looking at these stressors, right? You've got a lot of these things listed when we talk about restlessness, anxiety, you know, all of these different things that are going on. And people are trying to find the best way to cope right now. And there is discussion about what does that exactly look like, okay? And so it can be concerning right now and figuring out ways that we could help, you know, de-stress our employees and what are some of the good recommendations that we can provide to our employees to help them um, find calmness and serenity when, with their day. And like I think you made a comment, Cindy, about checking the pulse, checking the pulse of our employees on a very regular basis to make sure that they're doing okay. Mm-hmm. Whether their Especially job is tight Especially now because we, we know mm-hmm. that everybody's distracted by Absolutely. the current situation, by the way the situation is affecting them personally and by other family members. They're stressed by possibly being at home or the truck driver who's not at home but who's driving multiple hours to um, accommodate the needs of the public in these times. And so these are the kinds of things that we might see and be concerned about. And one of the best things that you can do as a supervisor is to create that psychologically safe environment and be a resource for your folks to come to. You know, dial in, pressure check them, find out how they're doing maybe more regularly than you're used to doing. And I think when we do get beyond this era, we may see as a result a lot more compassion in the workplace and a lot more coworkers and supervisors and coworkers developing that relationship. Absolutely, Cindy. And you know that empathy for the employee right now because, you know, you've got a variety of things. If people are working remotely at home, their children may be home and they're trying to, you know, manage that in addition to their job task. You know, and you did mention the truck driver or the person who's still working on the roadway. And they're now working, they're adding safety, um, they're adding extra safety measures in addition to their job task and the concern and the worry. So there's so many things that are coming into play with stress right now. Absolutely, absolutely, Lisa, and um, we we hope that we're giving you information that sheds some light on some things that you can do or be aware of. Now, shifting just a little bit over to a resource that we find really useful, when you run into a pill bottle in your own medicine cabinet or maybe someplace beyond, and you're not sure what the heck that was for, this drugs.com pill identifier is a great tool that not only tells you what it is, but tells you what it does tells you how it interacts, and there's even a, um, a pull-down that will tell you about how it impacts workplace activities and driving. So check that out as a resource. Uh, that's a really interesting way to learn more about what you're taking or what uh, your, your family member is taking, your, your mother or your father who may be now in your care, that kind of thing. And, Lisa, we like to talk about polydrugs. I know you you were going to have me talk a little bit about this, but maybe you'd like to shed some light on what, what it means to have a polydrug drug effect. Well, it's more than one drug in the system at, at any given time, Cindy, and a lot of times what we're seeing now when drug tests have been run, we're, we're identifying more than one thing, one impairing substance that's in their system, and we're seeing that pretty common, whether we talk about illicit or we talk about over-the-counter or we talk about prescription. So, you know, somebody who might have a cold, what if they're taking two different cold medications? What can be the effects? So we're seeing a lot more of this um, Mm -hmm. than we have before. So it's an understanding of how do they they mix and what are the effects. Well said, Lisa. And, you know, this is a great tool, a resource. It's great for a safety talk if you're having one on polydrugs, just to make everybody a little bit more aware of what they're ingesting and what that impact could be particularly if they've been taking a medication for a long period of time and now their allergies, oak allergies are really bad right now in Texas and now they need something for that. So um, this is maybe a list of some compounds that go together in ways that create a new set of symptoms, but I would really recommend that you refer to the URL at the top right to just check and see some different combinations that might be Uh, might be involved in your own life. Now, we like to use this three-column approach to kind of give a synopsis of what it really looks like, what's some overarching ways that impairment impacts an individual. This is by no means a complete list, but it is a really good reference tool. If you're just scratching your head and wondering, you know, something's a little off with that person. I wonder what could be going on. 
maybe looking at this list is is sort of renewing some of your concerns and um, and making you more aware of things to look for. Lisa, I haven't noticed any of these clothing items in your wardrobe, and you're known for your fashion <laughs> sense. So tell me a little bit about why you wouldn't be wearing this DEA shirt. Well, why I wouldn't wear the DEA shirt is because in really small letters is an L-E-R, which means dealer. And, you know, one of the things that we have seen and we have heard from some experts are you would be amazed at how many people who use illicit drugs are actually wearing drug-related clothing. And when, one of the last conferences we were at, the gentleman, he had all of these items displayed as well as pictures. And so it's extremely common um, for all of this paraphernalia that you can wear. And a lot of times us, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who, who is using illicit drugs, so I'm not familiar with all these branded items. But you would be surprised at how many different people, and it's been shared with us, waiters at restaurants, just a variety of different places that someone in general is wearing one of these shirts or one of these items. And sometimes they are drug stashes in addition to being a drug clothing item. So it can also be twofold. So just being aware that sometimes what they're wearing may not look like what it actually, you know, what, what we think it is. So I think it's very interesting at how prevalent this clothing is. Good point, Lisa. And I think that for the person who's looking for an opportunity to sell or buy, this is this is on their radar, and yet it's something that you and I overlook. Uh, so let's talk now a little bit about you know some of the ways that impairment can impact or be associated with workplace risk. We're used to thinking about in incidents and injuries, but Lisa, can you run down this icon list a little bit for us? Sure. You know, and we talk about impairment, Cindy, and we're talking a lot about, you know, productivity. That is what employers are really looking at right now is what is our productivity? And if somebody's impaired, there will be an issue with productivity, and it may cost the company a significant amount of money. We also know that making those errors, again, that goes to productivity. If we make errors, what's that cost? That's going to cost the company money. Those errors may also be a result of how you operate your machinery or equipment. That can also result in an injury. That means somebody could be injured and they could no longer be at work, or it can be our workman's comp. So, I mean, there are many things that come as a result of an injury. And then not only that, when we talk driving, we know that people are still having to drive. There are several people that are in essential industries, and they are still operating, and they are still driving. Mm -hmm. And they'd be driving to work, from work, or as a part of their job. And so all of these aspects are going to be impaired or going to be affected by an impaired employee. Really great points, Lisa. And, you know, I like that you mentioned the people who are operating the machinery. We've seen this and have a scenario about that in our drug impairment uh, training, as well as the productivity loss. We address that when we deal with another uh, critical need employee that's in our drug impairment training. So uh, if you want more discussion and more bullet points and more talk about any of these topics, then I just would recommend that you participate in some of our future webinars on impairment as well as our drug impairment training if you haven't done that already. And finally, while Lisa addresses some of the things that we see on this slide, um, we want you to be able to ask us some questions in the chat box. If you have some questions now, we're going to be wrapping up in the next couple of minutes. Lisa, fringe benefits are something that's on everybody's mind these days, particularly Correct. as Correct. the workplace shifts. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I made a comment a minute ago on the previous slide, and then, Cindy, I'm going to come back because there's a couple of questions I want to bring in for us. But, you know, we do know for a fact that there are all of these things. These are just a few of the things when we start talking about how an employer's bottom line is affected by an impaired employee when there's an injury. Whether we talk even off the job, there may be something that happens off, off work hours that indeed all will cost a company money. And the bottom line is a really key component and a driving factor for every occupational, you know, every workplace. And so understanding that, you know, liability is there, legal expenses, productivity, we know that that's a problem when it comes to productivity. All of these things are costly for an employer. And so understanding that, if, you know, an impaired employee is a risk. And so understanding how that affects the workplace is really key. Um, I do want to bring in a couple of things that were brought up, and I thought these were really good points. Um, many corporations have dinners and meetings where alcohol is served. Absolutely. We've all seen that. We're all aware of it. And some companies will put, you know, mitigating, you know, you know, factors into play. They don't always work, but they are a concern, and that's something that we do bring up in our drug impairment training when we talk about it is what are some of the safeguards? Cindy, do you have a couple ideas of safeguards or what can happen? 
you know, how can we educate our employees yeah, and employers? Yeah, you know, I didn't, I wasn't um, necessarily prepared for this question this morning, but some of the things that we know other companies have done is um, involve job sharing, setting up job sharing services ahead of time, using um, coupons for for the use of alcohol instead of just an open bar. But we know really the the key here is the employer planning ahead, the employer communicating these options. We know some employers actually um, include some free passes for uh, ride sharing, whether they're having a party or not, whether they're having an event or not. They include this opportunity for their employees to be able to sort of use a coupon in place of attempting driving at home. Uh, and that that's a great motivator for a discussion with your employees. It's also a really good opportunity to show your compassion in a way that does not necessarily impact your bottom line substantially or not nearly as much as if that employee was involved in a DWI off the job. So, you know, there it's a good time to be thinking about how we can support our employees, particularly this, in this era, and some of these supportive measures may be things that you want to include going beyond. Well, and, you know, Cindy, one thing, too, is, you know, some companies have a zero alcohol policy where meetings have no alcohol. They cannot be at meetings where, and they don't buy alcohol and they don't, you know, they don't serve alcohol. And so I think what's the company policy on that and what's the best policy and what's the safest policy? I think that's a key piece. One other comment that came in, and I think this is a really good comment, as you know, because when we talked about alcohol being an impairing substance, what about those who are actually drinking hand sanitizer? Now, we do know the wow. hand sanitizer may be readily available where you're at, or it may be hard to find also as well. But we know that other substances like um, – there are many other substances that people may actually drink that are not alcohol but do have a very high alcohol concentration in them, and people will actually drink those as well. That's a really good point, and we may not think twice about it in the workplace like some of the other, other components, Cindy. Well, and hand sanitizer may be something that you have an inventory for. So if you're noticing that you're ordering a substantial amount of something like that, you might begin to be suspicious. Just as we talked about inhalants that might be disappearing from the closet, um, you know, hand sanitizer is a, is a good example. Another example that comes up in the in drug impairment training is vanilla. Vanilla is about 40% alcohol. So if you've got, um, you know, people who are using that in their coffee, perfectly innocent most likely. They're just putting a little a little bit in at a time. But if your workplace is suddenly going through lots of vanilla and there's, you know, an employee buying it every month or, t or they're taking turns buying it, then that may be a red flag that they're using the vanilla in their coffee for more than just flavor. And, and you know, and Cindy, um, if you're making hand sanitizer too, we know that the you know the ingredients are pretty high. If you if you can't get alcohol, you can actually use like a vodka. And so we do know that sometimes those homemade hand sanitizers have a very high alcohol content as well. And so really good points. And I've seen you know again I like live PD, and I've seen it where they pull somebody over and there's been a large number of vanilla bottles um, empty behind wow. the seat. And so you know being aware. I think the biggest thing that employers can do occupationally is being aware. I think that is a key component. And Cindy, do you want to wrap it up as we end today? Yeah, you know what? I think that's a great wrap-up point, Lisa. We've covered a lot of different things that may not have been on people's radar before. And if you have ideas, suggestions, or questions beyond, feel free to contact us. Um, we love to hear from you, and we love to hear what's going on or of concern in your workplace. We certainly hope that you're being as safe as possible in this time, that you're slowing down, you're taking breaks, you're taking your own pulse as well as those of those around you and your employees, and that if there are ways that we can assist you, uh, th think of those opportunities that we give. Use our resource of a website, Lisa's blog, and just numerous ways to continue being in front of your employees about safety, about transportation safety, and about impairment during this time. Well, and you know, and Cindy, we did have the very first slide has all the upcoming webinars, and so we want people to know that during this time, um, remotely, however you're working, we have a ton of information, a lot of great, quick, easy webinars for you, your employees. Um, please take advantage of them. Please share them with other people because we are your partner in safety, and we look forward to working with you guys. Great. Thank you, great Lisa, and Cindy. Lisa. Thank you, Lisa and Cindy, for a great webinar. Thank you for all the information.
and thank you to all who attended. Please make sure you check out our upcoming webinars and uh, uh, take our brief survey. You can register on our website for all of the webinars. Thank you for joining us, and this concludes our webinar.